It does seem like a strange idea. Jesus, who is God, talking to a father who is God. And we get occasional appearances from a third party as well, who is also God. Really, it's a hard pill to swallow. I mean, how could God have these three parts or three persons? It seems alien or hard to relate to. With all the ideological reformation Swedenborg did, he must have gotten rid of this idea, right? Wrong. He was actually bold enough to say that only through understanding the Trinity can we gain a just idea of God. Not only that, your concept of it can even affect your location in heaven. And it's not alien. It's actually something so familiar that you're using it right now as you watch this. Okay, I'll stop making weird assertive statements. Now it's time for us to start backing them up. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg in Life. Yes, we are back. Thanks for your patience. And we're going to jump right in. We're going to hit the ground running. We're talking about the Trinity, the meaning of it, the importance of it, the what is it of it. And this is actually something that Swedenborg spent a good amount of time on, so you might as well get acquainted with it. My name is Curtis Childs. I'm the host uh, with the Swedenborg Foundation. As always, we are a nonprofit group that looks to spread Swedenborg's ideas and foster conversation around them. If you want to be part of the conversation, get your questions in, get your comments in, and we'll have a part at the end of the show where we address them and bring them up. And there may be some questions that I don't know how to answer because this show is right at the limits of what I understand. So will you walk that with me? All right. We're going to take a look. We're going to begin just with the basics. You, you've all heard of the Trinity, right? The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. This is a Christian, found, like a foundational Christian concept. Was Swedenborg into it? And, and why? And what is it? And how does it work? And does he have commentary on it? We're going to find out. We first just got to establish, so how many gods are there? I'm going to do that in part one. So we'll start at the top. We're going to be surfing a lot through Swedenborg's book, True Christianity, which, as its name suggests, was very much focused on Christian theology. Uh, And so here he is working to correct a lot of the things that he felt like were misconceptions or add to them and all that kind of thing. So we're going to be getting in there. We'll start in True Christianity 163, and as always... You can download this. Let's just hear, what what is the Trinity, and, and does it matter? This is Swedenborg's take. The Trinity is well known in, to the Christian world, yet in other ways it is unknown. Only through understanding the Trinity can we gain a just idea of God. And in the church, a just idea of God is like the sanctuary and the altar in a church building. It is like the crown on the head and the scepter in the hand of a monarch sitting on a throne. The entire body of theology depends on it the way a chain hangs from its hook. Believe it or not, we're even allotted our own place in heaven, depending on our idea of God. And you heard me reference that in the intro. And that may bother you initially. What what do you mean our idea of God determines our place in heaven? Is it doctrine? You have to know the right things and the right people to get into the right places? No, it's not it's not determining our place in heaven, like whether or not you go to heaven. Uh, that I would call that vertical movement. That love is what moves us up or down. Right? According to Swedenborg, it's what you care about. It's what you, um, what your motivation is. It's what you find to be um, uh, tasteful to do. It's it's what you think is right and what you act on. That. That pulls you up. You love good, it pulls you up. But once you're there, there's some horizontal movement. You know, the people are arranged according to how they see the world. So the idea of God is sort of the primary foundation for our worldview. And so, yeah, it can affect where we go. So, based on everything he said in that number, you could say that the Trinity is, in fact, very, very important. Yeah, that's funny. And very important. Um, And that might seem cool or that might seem a little bit intimidating. Why is the Trinity so important? Well, it's actually only important sometimes. <laughs> so Swedenborg says that it's important if you're a Christian in the first place. Let's say we're doing our spiritual taxes, right? And you come to the section on the Trinity and they're like, okay, could you please set, set your religion? What are you? If you check box 6A for Christian, then you have to fill out the next two pages about the Trinity. If you don't, 
skip it, go on to the next page, no matter what your faith is. Because Swedenborg says that there's this universal connection with God, and people can connect to it in many different ways. So if you're not already within the Christian tradition, if you're not trying to climb to God along that ladder, then no, the Trinity is not going to exclude you from heaven. But if you are within the Christian tradition, if you are thinking about God and life through a Christian lens, the Trinity, understanding that well, is very important. It's so important that he says, in the next life, Christian ministers or pastors, when they get there, uh, if they don't have it straight in their head, it's the first thing that they're taught. This is True Christianity 138. Upon entering the spiritual world, which generally happens on the third day after death, all members of the sacred order, that just means ordained priests, who have developed a just idea of the Lord, our Savior, are first taught about the divine trinity. So it matters. It's not just, yeah, the sacred order, like I was saying, is this is um, within Christianity. That's one thing you can call the, the ministerial class. Now, that's important. And even if you're not Christian, it's worth sticking around. You don't got to skip this show because this is describing aspects of God. This is a way to understand God. And according to Swedenborg, this is a very, very potent way to understand God. So there should be material in there for everyone. Where does the idea for our Trinity even come from, though, first? Where, where did we get this Trinity? Well, like a lot of Christian stuff, it comes out of the Bible. Biblically speaking, if you look at the literal sense of the text of the Old and New Testaments, particularly the New Testament, there definitely is a trinity. When Mary conceived, it talked about a trinity. It says, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So we got the Son of God. We got the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized, he says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That sounds like we got everybody there. Everybody made it into that verse. Uh, they've all got that verse framed on their wall because they're featured in it, right? When Jesus um, was talking to his disciples, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we'll actually be returning to this very number later, but that, that very much sounds like there's some kind of trinity happening. There's another quote about it. For there are th- three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And not to just always say we'll come back to stuff, but that referring to it as the Word, the Son is the Word, we'll come back to that too. And the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Plus, everywhere else, you can just see that you could cover, you could cover several screens in paint with all of the quotes. So there is a trinity, and Swedenborg agrees that there's a trinity. He doesn't say there's not one, but how, what is the trinity, and how do we understand what it is. And Swedenborg actually has some pretty simple instructions to give us so that we can just go understand it on our own. This is True Christianity 165. He says, left to itself, reason is utterly unable to see this trinity. How are we to understand its three parts? Are they three gods who are one God in essence and name? Are they three distinct qualities of one underlying material, meaning that they are just qualities or attributes of a single God that have names? Or is there some other alternative? The only good advice, so here we go, tells us to turn to the Lord God our Savior and read the Word under His supervision, since He is the God of the Word. Then we will be enlightened and see truths that even reason will acknowledge. And I would assert that Swedenborg overestimates our capabilities here. I find that if I go to the Word, even reading under the supervision of God, which I would assume here he's meaning just based on the rest of his theology, that you go there with humility and a desire to help the human race, still you're not going to find the kind of stuff easily that he did. For There's this whole layered uh, meaning system on there that, that talks about God and history and psychology, all these things at the same time. If you want to get a little more into what that is, we did an episode on it called What the Bible Is. That That's where we delve into just the kind of meaning that he got through this very method, which was approaching it, uh, you know, under the guidance of the Lord. Thankfully, he doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just say, go do it yourself. You can do it, just have the right attitude, and you'll get there. He also explains the whole thing, and that's what we're going to base the rest of this episode on. So that's the preamble. We're talking about the Trinity. It just What is it? Give me a sentence. Give me two sentences. What is the Trinity? True Christianity 166. These three 
The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three essential components of one God. They are one the way our soul, our body, and the things we do are one. Okay, I think we've started something. And that I can grasp. The soul, the body, and the things that we do. So we all have this sort of micro trinity inside of us. And Swedenborg says you can even use your own experience with with your own little trinity to picture it, that we are an image and likeness of God, as has been said. So by studying how ourselves and how we interact, we can learn a little bit about these things that seem like these great divine mysteries. And Swedenborg describes it a little further in True Christianity 169. We are all capable of using the trinity within each of us to picture the trinity in the Lord. In every one of us there is a soul, a body, and our actions. It is the same in the Lord. According to Paul's letter to the Colossians, all the fullness of divinity dwells physically in the Lord. Therefore, there is a divine trinity in the Lord and a human one in us. So this is not... You could sort of think, okay, this is this, this trinity. I don't quite know where that comes from. Uh, it's this thing unique to God. No, there's a, there's a human trinity in every single person that we really are a microcosm of the macrocosm, which God is that macrocosm. So we are just, we, we are little trinities walking around. So the more we learn about ourselves, the more we can learn about God. Soul, body, and actions. Here's the trinity. But do we usually think of actions as part of the person? I think we do, we just don't always verbalize it like that. For example, I'll take the example you're probably all worth thinking about anyway. Cleveland Cavaliers versus Golden State Warriors last year's NBA Finals. Did you guys watch it? We have LeBron James. It was the end of the seventh game. Score had been tied for a long time. Andre Iguodala on the Warriors got the ball and he was running down. He was uncontested for a layup, right? This was going to change the score, potentially win the game. LeBron James had been 20 feet behind him, tracked him down, jumped up, blocked the ball. This became a huge deal on the internet in the NBA world. Everybody's got, there's iPhone cases with it on the back of it. Now, the block, it's called the block. And you don't really talk about LeBron James anymore without talking about the block. That's a part of him. You know, anybody who's out there doing something, their legacy, what they've done is a, is a part of the person. We, we honor somebody at an awards ceremony. What they've done in their life is, is a part of them. And even down to us regular people, this, you know, the effect, you think about somebody that you care about, if you took away the way that they interacted with the world, you wouldn't have the full person. So we do, there is this keeping track of the actions as part of someone. We just don't always say it out loud like that. So that's the last aspect of the Trinity. All right, it's probably already confusing, so let's recap the whole thing. Here's a little diagram for you uh, about what Swedenborg says about the Trinity. He says that it is not a divine Trinity of three persons. So what, instead, what you have is the one God who took on a physical human manifestation in our word. In our world, I mean, this Trinity exists within and is Jesus Christ. So you have the soul, the human form of God, and the actions. And when the Lord took on a human manifestation in our world, that's when you get these terms, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this was because they were related to this process of saving us, uh, or that's how it's often put, of creating this new pathway. It was actually a complex process. Swedenborg describes some of it, um, and we did a show on it called Why Jesus Was Born. But so, so you have the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate specifically to this process of Jesus being born. The Son is the physical birth of this always existing um, human manifestation of God. And we're going to cover all these parts in much more detail. We just want to start to set you up. In part two, we're going to look at, so we have part one, which is how many are in there? What is there one God? Are there many gods? In part two, we've got ourselves a trinity in one God. How does the trinity work? We're going to look under the hood. How does it function? But before we do, we got a fan video submitted. We're going to show them, get yours in as well. We want to hear how is Swedenborg stuff affecting your life. So here we go. Uh, this is a little of how it affects. Hey Curtis and gang, it's John Biss, aka Blender. Today I'm here to talk about Swedenborg and me. You hear a lot of things throughout your life and sometimes things you hear that you're told are true 
just don't feel true and it takes a lot of work to make you believe that they're true or to behave as if they're true. But that doesn't happen with Swedenborg. There are so many things with Swedenborg that just feel right and just feel like, yeah, that makes sense. So when things make sense, it's almost effortless to incorporate it into your life and behavior. One of my favorite things that I find most comforting is Swedenborg's take on how God and the universe are always for us and not against us. And how they're there basically just waiting for us to accept the help that they offer. And it doesn't matter how long we hold off on that, they're there and they don't mind. In fact, they enjoy it. So to commemorate and to have that concept with me forever, I got this Swedenborg tattoo. Closer. So keep spreading the word and I'll do the same. See you guys next Monday. That's awesome. Thanks, Blender. We we love seeing uh, how it impacts and yeah, way to get that ink. Alright, you know there's a common saying. The common saying is we human beings are like the nozzle of a hose. Did you ever hear that? Maybe that, maybe I just made that up. We are going to show you today how we human beings are like the nozzle of a hose. And not only us, but somebody higher up the chain as well is like the nozzle of a hose. This is a special nozzle. It's got settings. You see, you can change it from stream to flat to shower. You've got this water coming out these different parts. It changes what a stream of water is able to do. And if you're trying to clean something in particular, sometimes you really need to have these different settings. It really matters. This allows the water to apply itself to particular tasks. We do that as well. You think about the stream of water as like our soul or like the full picture essence of who we are. Our, the entire range of our personality and capabilities, we completely change that based on situations that we're in. For example, we act a certain way at work, we talk a certain way to our coworkers. That's not how we necessarily talk to our friends or act around our friends. That's not necessarily how we talk to or act around our family. And I don't just mean we're putting on masks uh, to, to fake our way through it. I mean, it's just the way you act at work, you need to be that way in order to function, but it would be inappropriate to continue to boss around your friends after work is over just because you're the boss at work. It would be, you talk a certain way to your dog, it would be totally inappropriate for me to talk to all of you, my audience, like you were my dog. Does that make sense? Good boy. All right, so <laughs> what we let through matters, and this is going to help us understand how the Trinity functions. And another thing that's going to help us understand that is this two-part phrase here. And this is from Swedenborg. Uh, on our own initiative, on behalf of. Say that with me. On our own initiative, on behalf of. You don't really have to say that. Now, watch for this as it comes up in these next couple of numbers here, because this is the relationship right here. True Christianity 154, Swedenborg gets into it a little bit here. Uh, goodness comes from above or within, evil from below or outside. If evil were to act through us, we could not be reformed, but we would not be responsible either. By the same token, if goodness from the Lord acted through us, we could not be reformed. Meaning, acting through us, meaning if it just we were like a puppet and evil could animate us and do things, or the Lord with goodness could animate us and do things, we wouldn't. It wouldn't be our fault that we did it, but we could also never change who we were because we would just be whoever they made us into. Because good and evil are a matter of our free choice, we become guilty when we act on our own initiative on behalf of evil. There's our phrase, and innocent when we act on our own initiative on behalf of goodness. And there's a sense of, were, were they competent? Or can they be held responsible for their actions? It's when it's our own initiative. Because evil is the devil and goodness is the Lord. We become guilty if we act on behalf of the devil and innocent if we act on behalf of the Lord. The free choice that we all have makes it possible for us to be reformed. And there you have Swedenborg doing this thing that he does where he just says, oh, the devil with a capital D, like it's one person. But if you look at his theology, he says there's not a single devil that's a counterweight to God. We did a show called Is the devil real about it, um, where where we go into that. But you will find him doing things which which could be misleading to a brand new reader. So in there, you have 
this dynamic, this uh, on our own initiative on behalf of. So we can get influenced by good, we can get influenced by evil, we can feel the allure of each, we can see the reasoning that would lead us to act on each, but but it really, the line is crossed when we say, I, yeah, I want that and I'm going to do it, and then we do it. These are the steps that I'm going to take to get there. That's what acting on our own initiative on behalf is. It's not like suddenly you're completely channeling whatever force that is. You figure out using your own mind and your own concepts and your own personality and skill set to get where you want to go. That's acting on your own initiative on behalf of. Does it make sense? And it's not just a a psychological concept. Swedenborg says, via correspondence, there is a model of this relationship within our own body, particularly within the heart and the lungs, which you'll hear Swedenborg talking about heart and lungs all the time. But he says there is this same relationship between the heart and lungs, that the lungs act on their own initiative on behalf of the heart. And not only that, there is this relationship between all the organs and the circulatory system. And we're going to take a look at just how those relationships play out here. We got a buddy of ours, friend of the show, Dr. Ed Higgins, to look at from a modern anatomical perspective what Swedenborg getting at here with the, the relationship between these organ systems. How, how do they show this dynamic? So here's what he had to say about the heart and the lungs. All right, so if we think about this whole heart-lung relationship, it's actually a really cool kind of symbiotic partnership. They're, they're really separate systems. We can think of circulatory system with the heart driving the blood circulating. We can think of the respiratory system. So separate and, and working on their own, doing their own thing, but, but incredibly tightly dependent upon each other. And neither one telling the other what's gonna happen. So the system itself needs needs more carbon dioxide to be blown out. That actually drives, it drives respiration and even circulation more than the oxygen levels do. The system senses that there's too much carbon dioxide. Um, sensors scattered throughout the aortic arch where the heart sends blood out to the system, carotid arteries, brainstem, different sensors like little chemistry labs sample and say, hey, too much carbon dioxide. We need to send a message to the lungs. You need to breathe faster. We need to send a message to the heart, you have to beat a little bit faster, a little bit stronger. So they are very, very tightly bound working together, but they're not even directly communicating. It's all being driven by this whole system totally. So lots of different parts kind of taking their role, and then the whole system works out well. So it's this, there's this greater need that they can both tap into, but the heart's not telling the lungs, okay, breathe in. And even when you get those signals, I think it's not like, okay, now expand this much, now contract, you just, okay, breathe, and then the lungs know how to do that from there. So there's these organ systems that are working together, but one is not the puppet of the other. It's this collaboration. He says that that's important to understand, but there's also the circulatory system. So how does this principle show up here? And we find it most clearly in how the heart is sending blood out right, to the rest of the body, but it's not telling other organs how to receive that blood or what to take from it, and that explains that a little bit here. So the entire circulatory system, we have a heart that is pumping so much volume per minute at a resting state. The blood's moving around, carrying oxygen out to the other uh, systems, the other organs, carrying carbon dioxide back so that can be wasted out. Each organ then takes what it needs at any given time, and then um, that even changes given uh, different settings. So if we think about a person's brain, the brain's really small. The brain's like uh, 2% of the average person's mass. Uh, brain demands about 15% of the circulating blood volume. and uses about 20% of the oxygen of the circulating glucose. So that's that one really little part, but has big demands. And that's okay. All the other systems take their parts and, and no other system necessarily drives what any one system does. It isn't the heart sending things out, saying to the brain, you can only have so much oxygen. The blood circulating and everything takes what it needs. Uh, resting muscle gets about 25% of that circulating blood flow. Heavily exercising muscle uh, takes about 75%. So when that's happening, everyone else has to adjust a little bit. Um, there's only so much going around. It's the ultimate community. Everybody has their part. Everybody has to do their part. They each work separately, but but they all depend upon this this kind of mass working together. 
I love that phrase that Ed used, the ultimate community. And I think Swedenborg would 100% back him up on that. He even said that the human form is the schematic for heaven, that the way all those systems work together is the way heaven works together. See our episode, The Shape of Heaven, for more about that. So do you understand that? The heart is providing this essential substance in the blood and everything that it carries but it's not telling the liver you take this much okay you take it, the organs take what they need as they need it on their own initiative but on behalf of the circulatory system on behalf of the body right this is they know what the body needs and they know how they can contrib- contribute and everybody works together so that is the dynamic and this is this the same relationship that the lord and angels have. So the God-angel relationship is like this, Swedenborg says, True Christianity 154. All the angels in the heavens are filled with the Lord. They are in the Lord, and the Lord is in them. Yet for each of them, the speech and action depends on the quality of the mind. Some speak and act simply, and some wisely with infinite variety. They all speak on their own initiative on behalf of the Lord. You don't become you do this process, you you go up higher and higher, you clear out, you become this angel, right, according to Swedenborg. You don't just become then a, a open hose, right, just a funnel for the water of God. You are a specific nozzle part, man. You, you have a mind that is a certain way, and you enact God in a particular way on your own initiative. You know what God is, what God wants, and you th- think, all right, I'm going to try to help in this way. And th- it's not just like you all lose your individuality. We we need that diversity because everybody can bring something to the table of God's that otherwise wouldn't happen. So we are the last kind of rung in that chain. That makes sense. And that is then if we've got that, okay, that makes sense, Lord to angels, relationship, heart, and lungs, okay. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ does with the Father. This is where the Trinity rolls back in, is that Jesus is like this hose nozzle to the divine soul of the Father, choosing what's needed and helpful in a particular situation. Swedenborg describes it in True Christianity 153, God the Father works on and in the Son, but not through him. Do you remember our first quote about good and evil working through someone? Instead, the Lord works on his, uh, the Lord meaning Jesus the Son, works on his own initiative on behalf of the Father. There's our phrase. For he says, everything the Father has is mine. The Father has given all things into the hand of the Son. Also, the Father has life in himself, so he has given the Son to have life in himself. And the words that I speak are spirit and and our life. The concept that the Lord sends the Holy Spirit on his own initiative on behalf of God the Father, not the other way around, comes from heaven. Angels call it a secret that has not yet been discovered in the world, but discovered now, right? So that's the the chain. It's God is all this limitless power and possibility, and Jesus, the the manifestation, is the, the thing that can turn it into something useful for us. And this helps explain, there's a quote in the New Testament, John 14, where uh, Jesus says, on that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you, which is a lot of people and things being in a lot of places. So how does that work? Let's look at a confusing diagram. By confusing, I mean there's a lot going on. So take a second, take it all in, see on the left, there's you, I mean there's all of us, right? We're there, and on the right there we have the Lord. The, this, the, the Son in the, in the Jesus sense, this human uh, focal point of God. So here you have, um, let's go right to left. You have the divine soul, which is called the Father in the Trinity sense. The divine soul, this divine love is there, all the underlying essence. Then there is this form, or the wisdom, the Son, which on its own acts on its own initiative on behalf of the Father. So there's all, all this potential and then all this actual, and it acts through these actions, <laughs> acts through these actions, that makes sense, which are the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's our Trinity. We've got our own Trinity. See, on the left, our soul, our body, our actions, right? That we, and if we choose to accept the Holy Spirit that's emanating, the Holy Spirit meaning this wisdom, uh, this truth that's flowing out from God through God's own actions, that touches us in the mind. We can bring it in through through these higher truths we try to live by. We can bring that into our soul, and we do that by acting on our own initiative on behalf of the truth of God. 
right? So if we are acting on the higher principles that we know are right, we're bringing those actions into the world, we're the last link there, we actually bring this divine into the world through our actions. And you can, I mean, you don't need that whole diagram to figure out when somebody does something really beautiful, really loving, does something that helps you, helps somebody, you can just, okay, we got, we had God come through there. And that's the mechanics of, of how it works, according to Swedenborg. The Father is the divine soul in the body of Jesus. Swedenborg describes it more in True Christianity 154. He said, so, and this, this, go, this tells us a little more about our own soul and body, which, which I was surprised to hear initially well, when, when we were researching, when I was learning this show. The soul and the body are two distinct things, yet they are reciprocally united. The soul acts on and in the body, but not through it. Instead, the body acts on its own initiative on behalf of the soul. So we've got that same relationship. I before just thought, oh, the soul just uses the body just like a hammer, but there's actually more of a mutuality to it. The same is true for the divine and the human natures in the Lord. The Father's divine nature is the soul of his human nature, and the human nature is his body. The human nature does not ask its divine nature to tell it what to say or do. This is why the Lord says, In that day you will ask in my name, and I will not tell you that I am going to petition the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. If there's no, even on our, on our small level, with our little mini, mini trinity, uh, even when we shed the physical body and we go to the spiritual world, according to Swedenborg, you still have a spiritual body, meaning you're still a spirit in the human form. You still can interact and, and do a lot of the things you could do before. Even though you're spiritual, you have a form. You know, and that God has a form as well. And this is that divine human. But the form is not all of who you are. It's just the part of you that can be uh, addressed. So let's take a look back at our Trinity image from the, the thumbnail. So there we have, you know, the Father on the left and the Son and the Holy Spirit, or the, the divine soul, then the divine human, then the action. So Jesus acts on his own initiative, this middle part, deciding what's right, making the divine truth and love accessible and appropriate to the situation. And we're going to look now more closely at these different parts, uh, because we've, we've looked at the Trinity, we know how it works, but now we want to know Who's really in it, and what are these different parts, and what do they play? Uh, and, you know, how are the, is it not three people? So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to do it now uh, in part three. Roll call. So, uh, Divine Trinity, who's, who's present? Present, as Murray would say. Let's take a look piece by piece at these. We're going to start... And I see peace for peace. We're going to do like a eight minute section on the three most complex things in existence. So we're going to fly by these, but hopefully give some ideas of what Swedenborg says are the nature of these things. So we're going to begin. We'll go, we'll, this time we'll go uh, left to right here. Um, what is the Father? So let's take a look. Swedenborg puts it this way. In True Christianity 8, the notion that there is one God um, flows into our souls from God because everything that is divine as a whole and in every detail is God. And because everything that is divine is integrated into a unity, it cannot help but inspire in us the idea of one God. This idea grows ever stronger as God lifts us into the light of heaven. So God, the Father, is just one, one thing. It's an infinite thing, but it's one thing. Uh, this is the, um, this is the, the God that, that a lot of different traditions interact with and touch on. It's called by many different names. Uh, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, they call it Jehovah, but there, you know, there are other traditions. Swedenborg says that a lot of, you know, people all over understand this and, you know, have connected to this great source, but in we're going to stick within Judeo-Christianity for this show, and Swedenborg has a little commentary on, Jeho on Jehovah, as it's called there. This is True Christianity 19. The one God is called Jehovah from being, that is, from the fact that he alone is and was and will be. Jehovah means I am and to be, as is generally known, since God alone is I am and being or Jehovah. Therefore, nothing exists in the created universe that does not derive its underlying reality from him. 
This is why God here is called the Alpha and the Omega, meaning that on every level of existence, He is the one and only entity, the source of all things. This is the God that you just talk really big about. However, just because God is like infinite and eternal or an omnipotent and omnipresent and all that stuff, doesn't mean that God is featureless, that God is just this everything. God has characteristics, according to Swedenborg, uh, the Father does, and let's take a look at what those are here. So, Swedenborg asserts these these uh, bold claims, love itself, God, the Father is love itself, wisdom itself, life itself, and that also the Father radiates out like a sun in the spiritual world, and you can feel when you're in that world heat from it, just like heat from our sun, and you can see via God's wisdom, which is light from the spiritual sun. So that is, those are a few of the, the, the most important things to know, should you ever run into God while you're walking around and want to seem educated uh, on him. But what's it all for? Like, why do you, why, why would God have these aspects? Well, Swedenborg has commentary on that as well. He says, and this is from Crew Christianity 67, before creation, God was love itself and wisdom itself. That love and that wisdom had a drive to be useful. Without usefulness, love and wisdom are only fleeting abstract entities. God created the universe so that usefulness could exist. And I think that's what we call a twofer there, because you not only get why the universe was created, but you get why, you know, what the point of God is, usefulness, which is Swedenborg's word, which at times can seem a little drab for what it means, which is essentially love and action. It's doing something helpful to somebody. It's somehow working selflessly to create happiness in somebody or do them some kind of good. So that is what it's all for. So that's the Father. Um, now, we've covered that a little bit. Let's uh, go take a look next in the chain. Again, I said we're just blowing through it, but let's take a look now at the sun uh, and just see what's going on there. So this is the human manifestation, the Son of God, the true Christianity 81, by the Lord the Redeemer, we mean Jehovah in his human manifestation. Jehovah himself came down and took on a human manifestation for the purpose of redeeming. Now, we did a show, as I mentioned before, called Why Jesus Was Born, which this um, talks in depth. It's a whole hour about just why Jesus came, and we still didn't cover the whole thing. There's, Swedenborg writes a lot about it. Obviously, if it's going to be something of that important enough that God's going to bother incarnate, there's got to be something going on there. So we talked about that. You can check that out. If you don't want to check out the whole thing, or, you know, right now you don't have time to pop away, we'll give you a little summary of it. This is from True Christianity 81. This is a summary of what Jesus did. First, Jehovah, the creator of the universe, came down and took on a human manifestation in order to redeem people and save them. Two, he came down as the divine truth, which is the word, but he did not separate the divine goodness from it. All right, so the goodness is still tethered on there somewhere. In the process of taking on a human manifestation, he followed his own divine design. It's the same design we follow. That's why he was actually an embryo, why he was born rather than just appearing as an adult human being. For the human manifestation in which he sent himself into the world is what is called the Son of God. Five, through acts of redemption, the Lord became justice, or this Son. So the physical is the Son. Through acts of redemption, He, he um, glorified that or made it holy. Through these same acts, He united Himself to the Father, and the Father united Himself to Him, again, following the divine design. Why didn't God just snap His fingers and the whole thing was done? The design matters. He's big on the design. And then finally, through this process, God became human, and a human became God in one person. That's the trick. That's what needed to happen. When he was being emptied out, he was in a state of progress toward union. When he was being glorified, he was in a state of union itself. Emptied out and glorified, meaning emptied out is when you hear Jesus talking like, why have you forsaken me? Feels alone. Glorified is when he's got all this power. And in case you thought, those are kind of strange statements and you just sort of blew through them, I wish that there would be more explanation. Those are actually chapter subheadings in Swedenborg's True Christianity. So as I've been saying, click that book, download it for free, PDF or ebook, and then you can read the whole thing and see what he means by each of those. A question that would pop up in my mind if we we're going to be here talking about Jesus is, 
uh, did Jesus always exist? Was there always Jesus, or or did Jesus did Jesus have a birthday? You know, did did family life change? How did Jesus start? And Swedenborg has this to say about it, um, and this is actually from a short work of his called The Lord, number nineteen. People should realize, though, that there is no sun from eternity. Rather, the Lord is from eternity. Only when they realize what the Lord means and what the sun means can they think intelligently about a triune God. Okay, so that's why I can't think intelligently about a triune God. Now, the, the Lord is this human form, uh, which we've seen before. Here's a little uh, graphic of it. The Lord uh, is this. Okay, here we got these two graphics here. This is perfect. The Lord is this. This is the, the eternal human form, like the... You've got this God who's unknowable and seeable, but then the part you can approach is this human part, right? For this specific mission where this human part took on an incarnation and was born in a physical body, that is Jesus. That's the Son that you're talking about here. And as we'll get into in a bit, that, that, that really had an impact on what we're calling the Holy Spirit here. So the divine human... This thing always existed. This physical body that was glorified and, and brought in and had its own impacts, that did not always exist. But the divine human it was always there, man. Swedenborg talks about it in Secrets of Heaven 5663, subsection 3. Divine humanity was therefore what the ancient churches worshipped. Jehovah also revealed himself in his divine humanity among the ancients. His divine humanity was his actual divinity as it existed in heaven. Because heaven makes up a single human being called the universal human. Just a, in case you hadn't heard it, all the angels in heaven working together are like a single person, and that person is the closest image you can get to the Lord. So you're sort of seeing all of heaven at once. Anyway, this divinity in heaven is nothing other than divinity itself in the form of a divine person in heaven. This human identity is what the Lord took up and made divine in himself. He united it with divinity itself, just as it has always, had always always had been united. From eternity, it was one, which might seem like he just did something that already was done, but it was about the trajectory that he went down through this process, made himself vulnerable, could be attacked, could order hell, all this other stuff. Again, see why Jesus was born. These things he did because the human race could not have been saved otherwise. So that's a decent reason to do it. It was no longer enough for his actual divinity to be able to exert an influence on people's minds through heaven and thus through the divine humanity there. This is why actual divinity wanted to unite divine humanity with itself in a tangible way, through a human nature assumed in the world. Both are the Lord. So the Lord got this kind of upgrade, but the physical nature is called the Son. This thing you would just call, um, you know, the divine love, divine wisdom, and the the end use. You wouldn't call it the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this graphic that we had here, where there's this manifestation of this mission, that's where the Son came into the picture. And a little for one last thing on what the Son's coming meant for us. Here's True Christianity 109. Before his coming into the world, the Lord was of course present with people in the church. And Swedenborg uses that word, church, to mean a state of mind. We've talked on this many times. A church is something inside you, and it's, it's essentially is the presence of the Lord. It's, it's, you know, thinking nice things, willing nice things to other people. The good part of you, you know, your best self. But only indirectly through angels who represented him. Okay, so he wasn't able to be right with people. Since his coming, he is now directly present with people in the church. In the world, he added on a divine physical form that enables him to be present with people in the church. The Lord's process of glorification was a transformation of the human nature that he took on in the world. The transformed human nature of the Lord is the divine physical form. A proof of this is that the Lord rose from the tomb with the whole body he had had in the world, double hat for you. That, so there was some big deal that went on there that, that allowed physicality to get brought into God. So somehow that matters. You know, I, I understand some of it, uh, and hopefully you do too. Moving on, we've got the Holy Spirit, right? We, you thought we'd maybe forget the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit matters. Let's take a look at it right now. So moving on from the Son of God to these, we've shown it here as this, these radiating rays. This is True Christianity 138. The Holy Spirit is not a separate God. The word uses the phrase to mean the divine action that radiates from the one omnipresent God. So the Holy Spirit is 
uh, is the divine action, okay? Or in other words, you could put it that the life his wisdom gives us, that wisdom is not just like written on a paper, like something Socrates would say. Wisdom is the form of the divine love, meaning it's, it's actually the life that flows into us, if that makes sense. All right, moving on from that, uh, we had these different colors here, you know, radiating out of the Holy Spirit, and that was because there are different, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is kind of like this, we're saying he's like this hose, right? I might need this nozzle, you might need this one, right? We, we have, we're different people. If it was just the, the entirety of the divine soul crushing down on each of us, it'd be too much. We'd explode. There, that wouldn't be, it'd be counterproductive. Jesus knows exactly, okay, what do you need? This is what you need. This is how I'm going to do it. This person would take this. No, this person wouldn't take that. We are so like that. Some of us would absolutely do something while others would absolutely not. Something is going to impact someone that just has zero impact on somebody else. Just look at music. Look at the different kinds of music that people like. So Jesus knows that, works in it, and we are all these different parts of the rainbow as he's giving us the the wisdom and the love in, in the ways that we need it. So when Jesus was born, there was a shift in the way uh, that we receive truth and shift in this rainbow. So there were, the Holy Spirit changed in that way, or the way that we connect with it. And Swedenborg even asserts that this is reflected in the language of the Bible. Uh, the Old Testament doesn't really use the phrase Holy Spirit, but the New Testament, it's there. And Swedenborg talks about that in the Old Testament, the phrase was the Spirit of Holiness, and that that, cha- that means something because of the way Jesus was. We actually talked to a linguist and a translator who's worked on translating Swedenborg about this, and she had a couple thoughts on this change in the way that uh, the Holy Spirit is addressed in both Testaments and her thoughts on, on why it is. So we'll let her say a little bit about it now. When you read the Old Testament, you will, in almost any English translation, you will not find the spirit of holiness, which is what Swedenborg says is the phrase found in the Old Testament. He was using a very literal translation of the Bible. And it's true that in the translation he most heavily used, it's phrased as spirit of holiness. And that is because that is literally how it's put in the Hebrew. Hebrew could have said Holy Spirit. They do have an adjective, holy, and they put it with holy nation, holy people, holy God once. Uh, But with spirit, for some reason, it's always spirit of holiness, not Holy Spirit. Interesting, I looked in on a website that has 36 English translations of the Bible for the phrase spirit of holiness, and it appeared in only one place. It appeared in a lot of different translations, but in only one verse in the Bible, and that is Romans 1, 4. And that is because, unlike other places in the New Testament, where it is a Greek adjective holy with a Greek noun spirit, holy spirit, in that one place, the Greek has something more like spirit, a noun of holiness, another noun. And a lot of translations translate it that way. Swedenborg sees a distinction between the Holy Spirit and Spirit of Holiness. As a linguist, I'm inclined to think that they are exactly the same thing. It's just that Hebrew is more comfortable saying it one way, and Greek is more comfortable saying it another way. But it is interesting that it's put in two different ways in the Greek. The Greek can say Holy Spirit. The Greek can also say Spirit of Holiness. Swedenborg saw great inner meaning in even the smallest aspects of language, in whether a word was plural or singular, in whether a verb was active or passive, in whether it was directed to someone you or is about a third person, he, she, or it. Uh, So he would see a difference between the fact that in the Greek there's one place where it says Spirit of Holiness and uh, as opposed to places where it says Holy Spirit. So he could probably tell you what the difference was with just within the New Testament. 
And did that factor at all into which languages were used? You know, who, who knows? Yeah, so Swedenborg would say uh, every, every detail matters. And, but either way, even if uh, it's just an artifact of the languages used, the, this entity that's being referred to as Spirit of Holiness or o Holy Spirit is only referred to three times in the Old Testament, but, but almost a hundred times in the New Testament. And the New Testament is small, so obviously the Holy Spirit exists in some new way in the New Testament, right? That there was some kind of change. The Holy Spirit was affected by the birth of Jesus. Um, so there you go. And, and that's, you know, Swedenborg says that it's because Jesus was meant to be this connector to us, right? He, he was this, the mission was, there's going to be a new way to connect to the human mind. We're going to be able to be more present with people. We're going to be able to be more connected because he went through the same process we do. He was able to push away the same evils that beset us. It was this whole awesome thing. Again, watch our show, Why Jesus Was Born, watch our show, The Spiritual Struggles of Jesus Christ, uh, to get a little bit more on that. But essentially, the Holy Spirit um, by some accounts, was created when Jesus came, but at least was significantly transformed. All right, so you probably by now, I mean, we've been going at this for three sections, and so you're probably by now saying, uh, how can you say there's not three separate persons in God? How can you say it's just all part of a, the God? Because the Bible pretty clearly seems to state, even in passages you brought up earlier, this is you saying this to me, Curtis, even in passages that you brought up earlier, it shows that there are multiple different people in the Godhead. How could you ignore that? Are you just throwing away the Bible? No, it, it needs to be addressed, and we're going to address it now, and we're going to address it in the most powerful way possible, which is a, a fake game show, okay? So we're going to go at this, and we're going to go at it hard. How do you square what Swedenborg says the Trinity is with the literal sense of the Bible. So let's do it, and let's do it now. All right, it's time to play, and it's very important to remember that this is a generic game show. It has no uh, relation to any copyrighted material of any kind. Our contestant today is Dr. Jonathan Rose, series editor of the New Century Edition translation of Swedenborg's writings. Thanks so much for coming on short notice. Um, so we're going to walk you through some categories. It'll be your job. <clears throat> There's a lot of passages in the Bible that make it seem like there really are three different gods, mm. or at least two, uh, and we want you to, how do you explain these in light of Swedenborg's explanation of it? All right, so here are your categories. The first is Jesus praying. The second, this is your father talking. I count three and gift from God. So we're really gonna let you keep any money you win tonight. Mm. So choose wisely. What what's what would you like to go after? If I win anything. All right, good. <laughs> uh, I think I'd like to go for, I count three, 200, just to see what, what I'm up against. Okay, I count three for 200. Let's pull up our passage. This is from Matthew 28. Mm. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mm. That certainly sounds like you're being baptized in the name of three different people. So how do you square that? That's right. Uh, this is one of the clearest passages in all of Scripture that sort of teaches a, a trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet I notice uh, two things in here. One is that the word name is singular. It's not the names. It's just one name. In the name of the Father, right. of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I remember from the book of Acts that when the disciples who heard this went out and baptized, you'll see that they baptized in the name of the Lord, it says, or of the Lord Jesus or of Jesus Christ. Nowhere in Scripture does anyone ever take him up on this. So either they misunderstood or Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you also see that a little bit in the first part of the quote, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Well, heaven right. and earth kind of covers the subject. <laughs> so if the Father and the Holy Spirit are separate things, then the Father has no power in heaven. 
The Holy Spirit has no power in heaven. The Father has no power on earth. And the Holy Spirit has no power on earth because they all gave it to Jesus. That's so, uh, yeah, it's a bad deal for them. You might as well just, just go to Jesus. So it, it just drives a bit of a wedge into the common understanding of this phrase. Absolutely. Now, can you put that in the form of a question? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Good. Let's. Does he win? <laughs> yes, he does. All right. Okay. Great job. All right. Let's. Uh, let, that that was wonderful, and uh, it does make sense. I guess if you look at it in context, that yeah, that it can't mean three separate people because otherwise, yeah, everybody who's baptizing didn't read the memo. So yeah. I like it. Let's look at your next. What what category? The board <clears throat> is yours. Uh, ooh, let's try uh, Jesus praying for four hundred. Okay. Jesus praying four hundred. This is from Matthew 26. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And that definitely sounds like, not only is he talking to someone else, but this is somebody else that doesn't necessarily do what he wants. You know, he's asking for something. Would you grant it to me? So how do you square this with them actually it, being the same? It really is striking. Uh, in James chapter 1, it says that God cannot be tempted. Uh, what Jesus is going through here is a temptation. Okay. So he was part, he had a divine soul, but a human body. You know, he was born as a human being with all right. the frailties and so on that a human being has. And so God cannot be tempted. It was very important for him to be tempted. You see in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18 at the end there, that says that he was, Jesus was tempted so that he can help us when we're being tempted, when we're being tested. Right, because it's the same uh, process we all go through. Same process that we go through. That's partly why he went through it. That's the, that's the way that the purification happens. So when he's in that state, he's almost artificially in that human part, that frail mm -hmm. part, because the, the God part couldn't be tempted. So when he's in there, I think his consciousness is that there's two separate things. And what he's saying is he's surrendering that frail human will to that divine will that's inside. So he's actually getting the experience that we have of feeling disconnected from God uh, in temptation. Uh, that's right. That's right. And so we can relate and he's doing that partly so that we can relate and we see what to do in that situation. It's very powerful that here's how to do it. You know, okay. pray for God's will in that situation. All right. What do you, judges? All right. You win. Great. Really? Work. Yeah. You're starting to wow. rack up, but we, wow. I don't okay. know if we have the money number below you, but it's a lot. You're, okay. you've won a lot good, so good. far. Good. You want to try your luck again? Okay, I'm thinking maybe uh, this is your father talking for 400. Okay, let's see how this goes against the idea of one God. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Oh. John 14. Well, that's oh. quite different than the last quote we just saw. I mean, that's yeah. kind of... So that actually... Plays in I don't my know how hand, this got it? in there. That, that, that completely supports the point that you're trying to make. So... Um, wow. I, I guess it happens that there are passages that like clearly affirm this idea of one that's God. right that's right that's it must not the have been only like one. an error right. with our staff we put that oh, okay. in there we're going to give you that money right. anyway um, oh really and we're wow. going to we're going to let you do one more we're Bonus. almost out of time but so w what do you want your final okay. question to be well you know the name jonathan means gift from god so i'll go it with does. gift from god for 600 just okay go for a long shot pressure's on 600 gift from god that reads okay this is Little bits of all of Isaiah, we see verses 6, 10, 11, and 12 mm. in here. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And that sounds like it's talking about Jesus, and it sounds like it's talking about him in a functional role very similar to the traditional uh, Lutheran understanding or, or others of that he was taken on the sins of everyone as a separate person. So that's a tough one. How how can that mm. fit with what we've been talking about in this show this, today? I can see why this is a $600 question. The um, Especially that line there, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I mean, yeah. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. So really, is that, is that really true? Or is that written according to an appearance that it pleased the Lord to bruise him? And uh, so a lot of this does sound like, oh, it really feeds into that idea that Jesus came as a sacrifice. Right. And then that would sort of turn God's heart around or something. Uh, but if you look at Isaiah 53, 
the very first thing it says there is, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And before that, in Isaiah 52, verse 10, uh, it says, the Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And okay. very similar language is used in Revelation 1, verse 7 of the way that, uh, you know, every eye shall see him, even mm -hmm. those who pierced him, of, of Jesus. So if you see what I mean, this is linking the arm of the Lord with Jesus. He was the salvation. What it was making me think about is that if you have, you know, something drops behind a bookcase and you want to go get, you can't get your head in there, can't get your torso in there. Well, but I'm you sure put your, I believe me. Yes, yes. that's right. <laughs> but you put your hand back there. Yep. Your, your arm can go places that the rest of you can't go. And it's got your power and your will in it. Yep. So to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? If you realize that the scripture is saying there that Jesus, that manifestation of God in the world was the arm of the Lord. That was his own arm. Right. His own will was right in there, in that arm. Sweetenberg it was doing something that, uh, arm he couldn't do. wants to power. Right? That's power. That's yeah, right. Yeah, so it's his power manifested. That's right. Coming down and doing something. God himself couldn't come into this world as he is in himself any more than the sun could come down on the planet. You know, yep. it, it, it would just burn. The planet would vaporize long before the sun even got here. Right. But the arm, that human manifestation, was able to come down and do something uh, in this world. So if you realize that the text is saying that actually that is God himself in a particular adapted form, that yep. outstretched arm, uh, it takes away some of that sense that, you know, that it, it, it was pleasing to God, that Jesus sure. suffered or something. Right. I mean, that's not consonant with divine love. So the, 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 it's speaking according to an appearance. It, it's not uh, really straight up there. It's some of the poetry of Scripture. Right. And well, you can immediately, when you get a sense of, oh, Jesus as the arm of God, you immediately get this sense of how inter that's the same thing. You, you're not different from your arm. And, and all of this mm. uh, language about pain and suffering, and that's... This is the I'm willing to take this pain on to do to accomplish right. it, it, just a whole different emotional picture. That's right. That's right. If if that hand goes back there and gets hurt or something like that, well, I'm doing a job. I you know yeah. that's okay with me. It's all part of one thing. It's right. not it's not separate. I'm the one who feels it. It's not like go send that's the right. arm off to do it. Yeah, that's okay, right. Okay, great. So judges, what do you think? That's it. And oh. that, that turns out that was our daily quadruple. So you can take all that money. Take it all. Uh, and I'll give you some more after the show. Great. Okay, just just for your time. It's been great. So this is, I mean, and, and I know that you've you've done many presentations on these sorts of things. Um, and they can people can check out your Spirit and Life Bible mm. study where you go through and look at uh, the different quotes in Scripture under this Swedenborgian lens like we're doing here. That's right. Because you've got to reconcile that if you're going to go around saying uh, the kind of stuff we're saying on this show. So thanks for helping us get away with it here. Good fun. All right. Enjoy. Enjoy the cash. finish i think it's worth spending a little time looking at the divine human to clear up a little bit of this this son and the divine human what's the difference what are they all doing here and if we're going along that route there's a big statement in swedenborg's book the lord 54. he says god is one in person and in essence and he is the lord so the lord means the divine human so god is the divine human so they're not really separable let's look back at our trinity uh image from the beginning here. Um, Jehovah, so the, the white part, is the Lord from eternity. So this trinity came into existence when the Lord from eternity took on a physical body in the wor world, who is Jesus. So Jesus was glorified. Now everybody can see this underlying reality, or the Father, uh, who is, you know, because we have the Word. The Son is the Word. Now hang on to that phrase, we're going to get to it in a minute. Jesus says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So the Son is the Word. This human manifestation is the divine truth. That love and truth, as Swedenborg describes it, love is the essence of something, truth is the form of it. Really, this human form is the form of God. The underlying essence is this divine Father, so the form is the truth or the word. Now, the word is a term that Swedenborg uses to describe 
uh, both like the divine truth itself, but also the different ways we've been given access to that truth throughout history, including initially it was nature. People could read the word out of nature. It moved down into a series of, of books and prophetic voices, and now what we have is the Bible. But right before that, Jesus Christ, when he was walking the earth, was the word. Like he was the divine truth moving around on the planet. But now, none of us have ever seen Jesus, but a lot of us know about him. Why? Because of the the New Testament, the stories that were written, his, his actions written down. So that is now the Son. You know, so that's filling that perspective. We set all this up. We wanted to fill your mind with ideas, Trinity explanation ideas. What we want you to do is take all that, see if, we'll see if it's lodged in there, like a little window that heaven can shine through. Because we're going to look at John 1, which is actually a very Trinity sounding passage, but Swedenborg says that, that you can look at it through this lens that we presented today, and you'll actually get more meaning out of it. So what we want to do is say, you know, thinking of the Son as the Word uh, and what that meant, let's hear John 1 being read and just see if any of this stuff is sunk in, if it makes you feel any different about the passage, or maybe you never heard it before, see how, just see how it vibes and just let whatever wants to come, come. So here is a little bit from the beginning of John. In the beginning was the Word, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. So the eternal human God took on the form here. But the human God, eternal took on the physical form of Jesus here. But the human God has always been around and has been connecting with people all over this world. And, in case you want a little extra Swedenborg weirdness here, with aliens, too, or with people on other planets. This is Secrets of Heaven 6700. Regarding worship of God by inhabitants of other planets, there's a good tagline for you. The people there are not idolaters. They all acknowledge the Lord as the only God. Of course, none but a very few of them know that the Lord took on a human nature on this planet and made it divine. Still, they venerate the deity not as a divinity that is totally unknowable, but as one that can be known through its human form. This is because when divinity appears to them, it appears in human form, as it also appeared long ago to Abraham and others on this planet. Since they worship the deity in a human form, then, they worship the Lord. They also realize that no one can be united with divinity in faith and love unless divinity has a form they can comprehend under some mental image. Really, the main benefit is for us, that the human form of God allows us to form relationship. If it did not have a form, their idea of it would dissolve, like a line of sight vanishing into the universe. Told by spirits from our planet that the Lord took on a human form there, they pondered a bit. Then they said this had been done for the salvation of the human race. So they got it just like that. They also said that with utmost reverence, they worship the divine entity that shines as the sun in heaven, which appears in human form when it presents itself to view. So just a little anecdote about the spirits of other planets. In, In recap, if you or other people are not, that you care about, are not Christian, don't worry. And don't worry about them knowing the Trinity or not knowing it. Because as Swedenborg says, heaven and hell 308, the Lord's church is everywhere and exists with everyone who acknowledges something divine and lives considerately. So you're not going to get shut out because you didn't pass the Trinity test. However, if you are Christian or trying to delve into the Christian tradition or the Swedenborg augmented Christian tradition, see if you can chew on this Trinity thing a bit and get it to make sense. Because 
As Swedenborg says in True Christianity 169, uh, the divine trinity ought to shine like a lighthouse in the minds of people in the church, since God with his trinity and with the unity in his trinity is essential to all that is holy in heaven and in the church. And it may be that tonight we've only set you up with like a little shovel handle with a light bulb taped on top. We're not quite to a lighthouse yet, but so when we're saying we can get there, that it cannot just be, when I think about, you know, especially prior to this episode, I think about trying to understand the Trinity. It sort of seems like a chore. Like, okay, you got to do that, but that's not the coolest stuff. But Swedenborg is asserting here, and apparently he knows what he's talking about, that this can be something that is, that is like Blender was saying earlier, not something you just have to kind of be convinced of, but that is self-evidently true, and that flows and enlivens your understanding of life and of your own Trinity, your own soul, body, and actions. We're going to leave you today with a last thought uh, for this show on why God took on a human manifestation. This is from True Christianity 107. The reason why Jehovah God, who is called the Creator and the Father, came down and took on a human manifestation was so that we could turn to Him and form a partnership with Him. When we go see someone, we do not go to the person's soul. Who would be able to go to someone's soul? No, we go to the actual person. We see the person eye to eye and talk with the person face to face. It is the same with God the Father and the Son, because God the Father is present in the Son the way a soul is present in its body. And the the whole point is this relationship. I mean, that was the point of the universe. That's the the goal of divine providence is that we're going to have this intimate relationship relationship with God and with each other, and the, the form to do that through is this human form that, that, that comes. So the point is always love. As always, it's about love and specifically the ability to participate in making other conscious beings happy. And that's, that's the essence of life. And that's a simple concept, but it can be augmented by these other concepts, one of which is the Trinity. So hopefully that's something useful to have. Hopefully you're building a little lighthouse in your mind based on it, Uh, If you'd like to um, do something nice for people right now, you can like and subscribe because that's doing something nice for us. And it's potentially doing nice things for other people because that spreads our videos out on YouTube and it may be that this episode or other episodes are just what somebody needs to hear at the time. It it may be uplifting for them, so help us get the message out. And if you want to be able to make programming like this possible, uh, you know, weird stuff about the Trinity and aliens doesn't make itself, you know. Consider making a donation. We're a nonprofit. We run off of donations. This is uh, a little more about who we are and what we do. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. All right, we're, we're long. We ran long, as we do. Uh, but we're still going to take questions. I bet you thought I was going to say no questions. We're going to take a few here. We we can we never have time to take them all, which I'm, I'm sorry about. Somehow we'll figure out how to fix that. But if we don't ask you, answer your question here tonight, you know, ask it in the comments. We'll try to get around to a written response, and we very much appreciate your interest. So let's just take a look at a few here. This is the first one. Mark. The traditional Christian's view of three persons in the Trinity is fundamental to their belief system. Can you adopt Swedenborg's view without throwing all of mainstream doctrine away? I would think so. We once did a show called The Spiritual Reality Behind All Faiths, and we had somebody in there who I think had been trained in a Lutheran Lutheran seminary and an Eastern Orthodox... (laughs) I'm having some TH problems here. Eastern Orthodox seminary. But he also found Swedenborg, and like his name was uh, Ted Heckman. Um, so you can go the the spiritual reality behind all faiths is our episode name, and he said that Swedenborg's idea of the Trinity isn't as different as it sounds. That that there was you know there were some polemics that Luther threw out there, which kind of formed the modern idea. But really, in practice, the Christians are thinking something similar. I I don't know. Um, you don't have to throw out all of mainstream doctrine. It seems like Swedenborg can work with things. 
and really it's about this is going to sound trite but it's about love meaning uh if if you have a good intention behind your beliefs, that's more important than the beliefs themselves. So I think things could be compatible under love. It it does seem like there's a correction that happens in the afterlife. The Swedenborg says even even pastors there are given the the instruction about what the Trinity actually is. But I don't feel like my sense isn't that people who encounter Swedenborg feel like they have to throw things away. Um, that, that just seems like it usually is actually the opposite of that. Um, you'd get different people with differing opinions about it, and I, I think within Christianity you'll get some people that say, you know, I think once uh, I heard of a, a Swedenborgian church who was trying to use some software from a Christian church, and they said, oh, your idea of the Trinity is too different, we won't, um, we won't let you use this. So some people draw a line there, others don't. I, I mean, I don't. I think there's all those rays coming out of the Holy Spirit, so I think Whatever's, whatever's getting you to do the most loving, wise things for other people, that's good. So those are my thoughts. Let's look at the next one. Klegervin. Klegervin, uh, did God change after he united himself with Jesus? It seems like it. I know there's this dynamic of, uh, of God is unchanging, but in the terms that Swedenborg seems to describe it with, Yes, we read today that, that God is more present with us now. It's not like God's, God changed like, man, going through that Jesus thing really opened my eyes to a bunch of... It's not in that way, not an attitude shift or a moral shift or a personality shift. It's really about the, the access to us that God has from Jesus. So God now... This, the God that Swedenborg describes is, has certain design... Uh, based limitations. We we did an episode called "What God Can't Do," where we're talking about how um, God can't act against the design. So so you know, instead of God just saying, "I want to be closer to everyone," I'm going to do it. He instead went through this process of becoming Jesus, and through that process, God now is more able to be with us. He has he has a human nature that's united to the divine. A human became God, and God became human, Swedenborg says, and that does seem like a change. Whether that's only in our perception, whether something about the Father changed, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think the Father would have changed from that, but something about the mechanism that connects God to us has changed, um, and said that that had ripple effects on the Holy Spirit. So if you asked me, uh, I would say, yeah, God, God has changed. Yeah, the things are much more dynamic than than we often think. It's not just there's this static God us relationship, or God can never get a new coat of paint, or whatever that was. So those are my thoughts. Great question. Uh, let's look at the next one. This is from Zeke. If someone lives far away from people and has no ill will or hate for people, but just wishes to avoid them, is that wrong? Is it wrong to be a hermit? Man, I don't really feel like I can ever say it's wrong to to do something that that's ambiguous like that. Um, Swedenborg says nobody, not even an angel, can know all the different ways that that so- somebody can accept the Lord. There are a couple comments from Swedenborg that are relevant to that, though. He does say in his day there was this, uh, and there still is to an extent, this notion of to be spiritual you have to renounce the world and live away from the world and not participate. You you go to a some kind of compound and, and do that, and that that's more spiritual than living in the world. And he said, Swedenborg said, no, actually, what's more spiritual is to participate, to have relationship, to um, do useful things, to have joy and all that. Now, but I would not say that um, being, uh, wanting to be a loner is necessarily less spiritual. It's really about wanting to help. Like, even if you're alone, there's got to be something you're trying to accomplish for others. If you if you only were thinking about your own welfare and that's all you cared about, um, I don't know. I, I'd see, you'd probably be a little less connected. But let's say you're there and you're working online. You you have your cabin somewhere, but you're working on the web, doing something that helps people, but you're not necessarily interacting with them. I think that would be okay. And whether or not that nature would stay with you or change in the afterlife, I don't know. He does talk about uh, Swedenborg does talk about people, some people in heaven that live just like alone, but he does say family by family, so just like alone with their family, um, rather than in large cities, uh, but he says those are some of the best 
angels. They're directly under the Lord's care. So are there people who live alone and do that? Could well be. Um, I would, it would be too, too um, harsh, I think, to say, no, you, you have to want to be around people. You know, people are introverted. That's fine. What's really important is wanting to help you know, even if that's not coming face to face with people. So those are a few of my thoughts, but who am I, right? Okay, next one. This is our last one for tonight. Sorry, everybody. Mary, where does the soul reside in the physical body on earth? And where does God's soul reside in the grand spiritual body? Yikes. The The answer is, I don't know. There is an answer for the first one, at least. Uh, Swedenborg was driven by the same quest that you're driven by, Mary, is that he, he was going deeply into anatomy to find the seat of the soul. He was trying to say, where is the soul in the body? He was looking at the pineal gland. He was looking at different parts in the brain. Where is the soul? What he seems to have come to, to through his revelatory experiences is that the soul is not in one particular place in the body. It's in every part of the body. If the soul is largely shaped in the same way as the body, it's like if you could had like a soul detector, like a little screen you could put up, you would see soul every in in every cell. There's a soul, you know, in every structure. Um, there's a spirit. The spirit is linked to every part. That's why every part is alive. Um, he, but he even says like we take some of the purer substances of our body into the. Spirit the spiritual world with us, so I don't know. There's probably a lot more specifics that he didn't know or that we could learn or something like that, but the soul is all through you. And then as far as God's soul residing in the grand spiritual body, that would be in the body is made of the people, so God is in every single person who's acting in love and wisdom. So in the same way, God's soul dwells in every little cell or every little little person of the grand spiritual body, although God is outside time and space. Um, but then again, the whole grand human thing isn't really spatial. It's it's f- schematic, as I always say, but it's like form or function based rather than form based. So God is is in everybody who loves and and does something good and becomes wise. So just like in the body, God is present in every little bit, and the more little bits, meaning us the more people who are accepting this love and acting on our own initiative on behalf of the love, like we're talking about, the the more full the body becomes and the more the spirit, which is God, and the body, which is us, the human race, dwell together. And that's, that's, I guess, like another trinity, right? We're this body that God can inhabit like a soul. So those are a couple of thoughts. Great questions, everyone. We're going to be back next week again. And what we're going to do is, you know, we, we went super complex this time. What what do you do if you're just encountering Swedenborg? Or what do you do if you want to just step back and see the big picture? Next week, we're going to do Swedenborg 101. We're going to look at the basic nature of everything. This is something that, you know, e- either you need a refresher on or you could show somebody who is just coming in. And for myself, I do like to step back and say, so what's the uh, elevator pitch? What What is Swedenborg saying about everything? And we're going to look at that and sort of the layers of meaning he places on our everyday life next week. So I hope to see you then. Thanks for hanging out. Bye.